I guess I'll go ahead and get started. My name is Pascal Jory. I'm a functional architect with the HP Software uh, Cloud Solution Lab. And today I'm going to discuss about um, application deployment in hybrid cloud. So hybrid cloud is um, being kind of a buzzword these days. My definition of it is the uh, deployment of IT services between a private cloud and a public cloud to take advantage of economies of scale, distribution of risk. Just to get a show of hands, how many of you have already deployed uh, an application in production in a hybrid cloud? Okay, very few of you. So what I would like to do today is cover a few topics that you see on this slide, and then I have about 10 minutes for Q&A at the end of this session. Also, to clear um, the mean-spirited jokes on Portland weather, for me, Portland weather is just full of surprises. Now, let's discuss about the user story of uh, a typical deployment in a hybrid cloud. So initially, we have this scenario of this mean manager, Peter, who is calling um, was going to, to deploy this application for demo and orders and he did it right away. He called Stan in IT. Stan is not available, but Mr. D that you see on this picture and you might recognize him is available and he's one of the sharpest knife in the drawer. So what Mr. D does is he goes into the service catalog, just picks an application and then upload a few software packages on the software definition library and then publishes the design and deploys this application in a private cloud initially. So you see here the application that we use when we prototype this, we had an Apache load balancer as the front end uh, application tier with Tomcat servers and then a simple MySQL uh, database in the back end. Now a few weeks go by and then Stan or Mr. D noticed that the application monitoring thresholds have been crossed and it's about time to add an additional tier to this uh, Tomcat server. So the IT engineer just goes into the console and adds a new tier, a few clicks and here you go, you have a, a tier that's published, uh, available now in the cloud service, in the HP cloud services, the open uh, OpenStack HP cloud services, with in the front end still the same Apache load balancer. So we've all heard this uh, story before, and now we have a few questions that we'd like to be answered. And one of them, the first one is, how do you make this reusable? Very nice to do that for one application, and we'll go over the steps of what it takes to do that for one application. But how about you have to do that again for another application? And how about you have to do that and deploy to another public cloud environment that's not the initial one that you've deployed? It takes a lot of work. Other questions about performance. How does it work now that you have an application remotely distributed? About scalability, how do you scale this application? security issues and concerns, capacity management. So let's go over the steps that it would take. And it is a very simplified diagram to deploy this application initially in a private cloud environment with all the different steps to initially deploy the database tier and then the application tier, configure the security on each tier, deploy the monitoring, add to the load balancer. And then you have the bursting component, which is the, the, the steps to deploy in the public cloud, and then to configure the, if finally in the private cloud, the database security, and add a worker to the load balancer. So as you see, there's, there are many steps here, and the concern is you could do everything by simple scripts. However, it's going to be a lot of work if you want to make it reusable. So let's look at the solution architecture that we used in this deployment. So initially you design a service. You design a service that is an abstraction layer that you want to reapply many, many times. 
and then you publish this service to a service portal and a service portal from the service portal a user can request the service and then using the orchestration engine in the back end the service will be deployed so initially you see a deployment in the uh, private cloud and then you add monitoring on top when the bursting comes along similar scenario where you will have the monitoring triggering the bursting in an automatic bursting scenario and then the orchestration engine adding a new tier in the OpenStack public cloud environment. So in our prototype, what we used are the HP suite of tools um, that some of you might be familiar with, uh, cloud service automation for service design, service portal and orchestration engine, uh, server automation for your software deployment and configuration tool, uh, otherwise known as software def definition library. And then we had the, as an OpenStack public cloud, the HP cloud service. And here, uh, for monitoring, we had used, we used the SiteScope tool that's an agentless monitoring, monitoring tool. And then initially on a private cloud, we used the VMware. So just for those of you who are more familiar with open source tools, uh, I've done just a, a mapping of a few of those tools uh, with the, um, Puppet Labs, for instance, um, Dagios for monitoring and uh, Eucalyptus for uh, orchestration. Now, the next step is how do you design the service? So here, what we want to have is an abstraction layer that allows you to configure multiple layer on a single pane of glass. So we configured the private cloud environment with, you see a database tier component here and a load balance application tier that could be a number of them um, here. And then once we burst in the public cloud, we add um, an additional tier here that's load balanced with the same environment. And you'll see that you could also burst in uh, an EC2 public cloud. We also did that in our prototype. And it, from the same, exactly the same uh, uh, service design model. So what does it mean when you look under the hood? at the execution of this service model. Now each component of this service model, uh, for instance, the application tier, will have a binding to a list of resource offerings. And those resource offerings, as you see on the screen, could be deploy a VM uh, on the OpenStack layer, uh, deploy an agent to the virtual machine, execute software policy, configure it, and each one of these uh, resource offering is it in itself has, has a life cycle. Life cycle tells you when the action will be executed at different stage of the service. So not only you have the deployment stage, but you have the, the stage where the application is deployed already and you want to start or stop or restart your application or patch it. And then you have the uh, undeployed stage where you just want to delete your VMs and that's how you would move your VMs from one environment for instance if you wanted to move all your VMs from one private cloud environment to a public cloud environment uh, that's uh, what you would use so each actions that's bound to this life cycle is essentially an API wrapper that executes the API in the back end so in the end you execute for instance a Nova API compute and then you create a VM and then you move on to the next step. So what does it mean to interact with the HP uh, cloud service instance? So especially in related to comparison to a vanilla OpenStack instance that you'll get from DevStack, there are a number of features that you would look for. And the first one is an SLA bound. So each component has a lot of redundancy built in to that infrastructure. And so that gives you an SLA that's guaranteed that could match an SLA that you have in your private cloud environment. And then the second part is choices. So you wanna have choices to deploy in different zones and different regions and different geographies. And that's what this uh, public cloud solution offers you. 
And finally, you want to have some level of security that's also built in with intrusion, automatic intrusion detection and scanning that you don't have to worry about. So you have pretty good confidence that the images that you will save on the public cloud will have some security added to it. And what are the, some of the lessons learned that, uh, from this integration? One of them was that we had to deal with the management of the SSH private key. So when you, if you're, some of you are familiar with deploying VMs on public cloud environment, one of the first thing you do is you associate a key pair. And when you create that key pair, you have to so save the private key and put it somewhere safe because you're not going to be able to retrieve it from your public cloud. So here, if you have to deal with multiple of those because maybe you have one per tenant, for instance, then you have to find a, ma a way to manage it so that they are available for the next application that needs to use it. For instance, my software definition library, uh, server automation that needs to deploy my software stack on top of that VM. So that was one of the, the items that we had to deal with. The second one was um, due to the fact that you have many different zones available that gives you the opportunity to develop your, deploy your application tier if you have many of them in different zones. And if you know in advance which zones are redundant between each other, then you can add redundancy to your application tier that's deployed in the public cloud. And finally, um, we had to deal with the error checking. We noticed one thing is that when you try to map properties between your private cloud tool that's going to execute the orchestration and the public cloud properties such as images, key pair, you don't have control necessarily on the public cloud properties. And so you have to build some type of error checking and error reporting so that you get some clean, um, a clean state when there's a mismatch between private cloud and public cloud. And we also looked into uh, using dynamic properties so that you dynamically pull from the public cloud uh, provider uh, at, at subscription, at deployment time. And finally, to supplement the console of the public cloud provider, we made extensive use of the debugging tool like the, the Nova client. So now that you have debugged and your solution is finally ready to go, you're going to start end-to-end -end testing and demos. And once you do the demo, that's when you hit some major performance roadblocks because you're going to deploy a software component in a remote cloud and it takes forever. So the solution here is to use a distributed in architecture with your software definition library. And it turns out that uh, HP Software Automation supports uh, that type of distribution with core uh, master server that you can keep in your private cloud. And then a satellite component that you can have in your public cloud environment and keep as an image that you would deploy right before deploying the application. And the benefits of this architecture is not only you increase the performance, but you can also have take advantage of the, the caching. So there's caching at the satellite server level, but also you can deploy all those target VMs on, on the public cloud environment, on one public cloud environment would be tied to a satellite. And if you have other public cloud environments, in turn, you can deploy another satellite that would manage the, lo the VM locally. So kind of a double, double benefit, plus the fact that we have a security that's greatly simplified between a core and a satellite server. So the number of ports is reduced. Now, what about the flexing and the questions, the two questions that you want to ask are, when do I flex? When do I add new tier in my application? And how many do I have? But before you get started on that, you have to think about quotas. And quotas are extremely important here because you're dealing with a public cloud that in theory has infinite capacity. It's not true, of course, if you're the business manager who has a limited budget to deal with. And so you want to implement quotas, some kind of quotas uh, that could be by tenant and a tenant could be mapped uh, through your LDAP organization. 
and we did that in our implementation where each user subscribing to a service, an application as a service, similar to this one, will be limited to a certain norm, uh, a number of instances that they can deploy. And after that, uh, you'll have to go maybe through a special appro approval process before you can deploy uh, additional, additional tier. Now that you have your quotas, you can define the thresholds. And there are three ways actually to trigger your application bursting. The first one that you not, that's not very sexy, that you don't necessarily think about, is the uh, manual trigger. But essentially, this is usually the most controlled one, and it applies uh, in many organizations. That's how we got started with uh, this. And it lends itself better with change management process, for instance. You have kind of a more controlled environment. Now, if you have an SLA that dictates you to, flirt, to burst and flex uh, within certain limit, uh, time limit, then you'd want to either have a scheduled bursting where you, you kind of forecast when I'm going to have a peak demand. So it could be right before Christmas, you have a sales application and you know you're going to get lots of requests. So you, you kind of schedule this uh, flexing ahead of time. And finally, based on threshold, and this threshold would be driven by some type of load that you would have on your system. Um, how much do you add once you know your threshold? And this is a very good question because you could have many VMs that you'd want to add in your public cloud environment. And this is going to be driven by the business logic. Where does the business logic reside? The business logic could be a simple rule that you have uh, in a database, but eventually the monitoring tool, the monitoring framework is going to execute that business logic and tell my orchestration engine, this is, you've crossed the threshold and this is what I want you to do. So this is an important consideration because there is very tight linkage and when you think about frameworks like um, Silometer and Heat and how this is gonna play together, um, there's opportunity here to, to have those rule engine to develop the, the business logic. It has to reside somewhere. And finally, something that's very often uh, overlooked are all the change management consideration. And if you have an orchestration engine, you'd want to include the um, approval process, appro approval tools like Remedy or Service Manager. You want to include some type of notification and finally, CMDB. So maintain the state of your application in the CMDB. And at flexing time, you'll be able to update how many tiers you have at which level. So that's another uh, integration that we, we supplied with uh, HP Cloud Service Automation that would be important to add in your overall ecosystem of, um, to make this solution work in a production environment. In test environment, you can just get you don't need to, to worry about all this stuff, but when you move to production, that's when they have uh, greater importance. And finally, let's discuss about security. So security, as you know, is always a, a balancing act, which means I have privacy concern with my data, and that's why a lot of enterprise, they don't move directly all their assets in the public cloud. They'll have some assets in the private cloud environment, and that's why we have hybrid cloud in the first place. So we will have database components that will reside in the private cloud environment. And then you'll have your application tier that will reside potentially in the public cloud environment. Now you could have many of these, uh, many of these tier, but what matters is the automation that you build around the layered security. So you, you're going to have automation build, every time you add an application tier, you have to register that tier with the database. So you have an application level security that you're going to configure. And same thing, you can have access list um, so that only this database can discuss, can, can have communication to that application tier. So this is done dynamically. Same thing for IP tables. Uh, all those VMs here will come with pretty, uh, on, on, Red, on Linux, will come with pretty fine IP table that you have to tweak to exactly match the protocol flows 
that you're going to have to deal with with first your management applications. So here you see monitoring, software, library, and execution engine all need to communicate to my application tier and also to the application flow. So this is the second level of security. You can add a security group that's predetermined if you know it in advance, so you associate it to your VM, but eventually you have to deal with all those flows. So one important feature that uh, came up recently with OpenStack is the virtual private cloud. Uh, and, and this is a critical way to create the isolation of this application tier so that you can open uh, holes in your corporate firewall when you're going back from the application uh, to the database. Uh, otherwise, you don't control the IP space and you're gonna have to open uh, essentially a giant hole through your, your firewall. So that brings me to the next slide, which are what are the opportunities coming with, with new OpenStack projects when you think about integrating uh, into a, an OpenStack public cloud? The first one I just mentioned is to control and isolate your application tier in, and all your application tiers, actually multiple VMs within the same virtual private cloud. So that, that's going to be key, um, key enabler and, um, and that's now possible since Folsom um, with uh, OpenStack networking projects since I'm not supposed to use quantum anymore. The second aspect is about uh, load balancing as a service. So there are some new developments with uh, Grizzly um, coming up with Atlas project uh, that allows you to create uh, a uh, load balancer as a service component. And that would be Great to have this if you have an OpenStack private cloud and an OpenStack uh, public cloud to deal with, and then you could have, you could reuse the same API and potentially take advantage of some uh, load balancing alg algorithm that would determine, for instance, uh, where should I add my next application tier? Should it be in, uh, based on response time of different cloud environments. Should it be in my private cloud, my public cloud, and which instance of my public cloud should it be? And finally, some opportunities with the Silometer project. And uh, there was a presentation this morning about Health and Mon, which is complementing that project. And that will allow you to collect more data from the VMs that are created in the public cloud and uh, have uh, um, metrics that you can gather and enforce some type of uh, business logic uh, to make decisions on uh, thresholding. So for more, and more information, I encourage you to attend, of course, other HP presentation uh, during this week. Stop by the HP booth, and uh, also you can learn more about HP Cloud Service Automation. Uh, we have a Wikipedia web page, and this is uh, below our main uh, web page. And finally, if you are falling asleep, be careful because the bell might ring without notice. I don't know if you've seen that at the very entrance. So now, uh, thank you. And if you have any questions, um, now's the time. Yes, question in the back. Do you think there's an opportunity for OpenStack's community to, to support this, this sort of cloud bursting, hybrid cloud use case more directly? Or do you think it should <coughs> be something that's like, like what you did, built on top of, of these components external to OpenStack? Yeah, so what I described here, yeah, it would greatly simplify my work if there was an OpenStack private cloud as well as an OpenStack public cloud because then my service model will be just one single component and the set of API I would use, I, would just, I just have to deal with one set of API. So yes, that, that, would, that would help a lot in terms of direct impact of projects at this point. I would say, for instance, the load balancing as a service would be one of them. If you could you know, have a, a way to um, support some methods to load balance that would have um, uh, measure some response times, that, that would be useful, yes. Yes, question. Yes, so the, the SLA is, is going to be different from one business to another. And you have to essentially develop that business logic and 
and make it reusable somewhere. So you have to have some type of rule that would tell you this is when and how much I will flex. And then let your engine feed that to your orchestration engine. Yeah, so, so you can set up some platform or some, some infrastructure to measure the performance. And this could be kind of the topic of a different discussion uh, that would lay on top of this, potentially. Yes, question? Yes. The, the, the configuration of uh, security rules does not impact my performance. What impacts the performance is when I start uploading software packages, because these can be large. And even though in our simple prototype, we just had the Tomcat bits, it still took a long time. So you can imagine with a more complex application, uh, it would be even greater. But that's kind of also the, the profile of an application that's hybrid cloud friendly, quote to quote, is that you, you want to take into account the fact that you're going to have to move those software packages around uh, quite often and very dynamically. So if the smaller it is, the better you are. Yes, question in the back? So Tosca is coming up uh, with our next uh, generation, next releases. Uh, we're going to have a Tosca compatible topology model that we're going to support. And again, I encourage you to discuss with some of the people at the HP booth if you want to know more about the uh, product roadmap. That's all I have. Any other questions? Yes, question in the back. So earlier you talked about the uh, SSH key. Uh, yes. Yeah, so we did not look into specifically the changing the public key uh, update. There's a, an administrator task in the back end who has the control on the public cloud access. And then there's a different persona who is the subscriber of the service. And those people, the administrator kind of takes care of everything that has to be done in the back end, including the management of keys, you know, where sh they should be stored. And then the subscriber just orders the service and everything behind will be automated. But I'm assuming that there's a persona who's an IT administrator who will take care of, of those types of, of issues. It's not something that we uh, consider completely automating, uh, at least when we looked at our, um, our solution. Well, if you don't have any other questions, then uh, thanks again for your attention.